the morning we went up there, I, they had pretty much, I'm not sure whether we already knew, I think we already knew. They had gone in and put the surveillance equipment back up there and stuff. And I think the morning we went in there, we already knew that they were going to pull us out. We were not going to get him. I believe they were going to do something different. And our only job was to go up there and make sure that we're, we're, we're going to try and make some plans. Where we're going to put insertion teams in, where the plan was to put an undercover guy up there who was going to buy this land above Weaver. He was going to go through there, get to know Weaver, and then he was going to ask Weaver to help show him the property lines up there. We were hoping to separate him from his family. Billy and I were looking at different places where we could put people and not worry about them being detected. And that's when we looked at that one area on that bluff. We were thinking about putting one in there. We pretty much had already seen everything that we wanted to see and done everything up, up top. And we were ready to go back down. And it was when we were on our way back down that we heard the sort of a wash sound like a creek running over a bed of rocks. Or a vehicle. If you're out in, in the country and you hear a vehicle, you know that little sound. It sounds like running water or something. First, We heard that and someone came over the radio and said, there's a vehicle approaching. So we think there's one coming up. We hit on the side. And the next thing you know, that dog that they had, and I believe it's because of that vehicle noise. I mean, you may have heard the radio, but we had, we had headphones on. I don't believe he heard anything except that. That dog came to the, to the uh, edge of the driveway there and started barking. And I don't know, they said that pretty much whenever the radio traffic went. You know, I mean, these are a number of years since then. You, you can look at whatever it says. But that's when the, the chase really happened. The dog either winded us whenever he came to that end of the driveway or, or whatever he did. But that's when the chase started happening. And we were taken off and trying to break contact, which was our plan. And we ran uphill and through woods and then came to a flower field. We called it a flower field. Uh, because there were no trees in it and it had, you know, flowers probably about knee high or higher. And then as you come out of that flower field, then you go back into this canopied area that's straight shot down through there and, and the Y is about halfway down through there. And that's uh, when I told them, or I probably told them before that, let me take the rear because I had a weapon with a silencer on it. And if the dog got close enough to me, I would kill that dog before I would allow him to lead him to us and cost us our lives. But I didn't want to shoot the dog if it was going to cost me my life. <laughs> you know, if somebody sees you kill their dog, pretty much they're going to kill you. So I told them when we started, when we got to that canopy area, it's a long straight shot down through there. And somebody would have a shot at our backs. And I said, you know, find us a place to take cover because I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to get shot in the back while I'm running. And we get down there. And it was at the Y that Weaver showed up. I saw him, and I held my gun on him, and I told Artie to take him because the dog is coming up on me. And I heard him say, Weaver, freeze, freeze, Weaver. And then I said, back off U.S. Marshals to the, to the guys behind the dog. And that dog got to me about that time. And I, and I made this stupid statement, I guess, that, dances with dog, but that's what I was, he, he was moving and I was sticking that gun in his face and he went around me about three quarter way and then he took off. And then I looked over my shoulder and I saw Billy going into the woods, so I went in, in behind him. He chose a stump and there wasn't room for me behind that stump, so I kept going and that's when I found the place I did. It was a great place. And I talked on the radio to him, asked him to come join me and he didn't answer. And I knew that they were must be close if he wasn't answering. So I, I looked up there, and I could see the light through the trees. 
you ever been in the woods and you see something breaking that light, they, they were breaking that light and they were coming out. They walked past Billy, it looked like to me, and there was a tree right my way up here, somewhere in that area here. It didn't look like it was maybe three to 10 yards, something. And he said, freeze U.S. Marshals. Now, I think he said freeze U.S. Marshals because that tree that was out here, there's a little clump there. Last time I saw Artie was up here. So I think he thought if they went around that tree that they would see Artie. He said, freeze U.S. Marshals. And Harris turned and fired. And when he fired, I had my I put my I had my gun up, and I was waiting for Billy to return fire because he was there. He had the best shot, and I knew he would be. And I look, and Billy starts. He starts falling. Is what he's doing. So Harris is coming up to put another round in the chamber, and I thought he ain't going to do that. Now I, I didn't know. I can't say that I. I can't say I wanted to miss him, but I think I was just concerned that if if he stopped him, he'd be all right. And I shot, and I thought I hit him. He went down. And so then I turned my weapon on, on to the kid, Samuel Weaver, and he's standing on this side of that tree that was in front of me. And I made a decision that I wasn't going to shoot him because he didn't shoot at Bill. He had a rifle and he had a handgun. And it was about that point that uh, Art shot the dog. Art shot the dog at that point because I'm looking through the sights at him and he turns his head. He was been looking back at Harris, his direction. He looks down this way and he says, you son of a bitch. And he's talking to Art because Art shot the damn dog. Well, then he took off up there. And about this time, Billy calls me and says, Coop, Coop, I'm hit. I said, Billy, I'll be there as soon as I get him off the grass. And I told Artie and he needed to get back up there because I needed help with, with Billy. Art, thinking I'm back up on the trail, gets up on the trail, and he get, they get the bullet that goes through his shirt, it goes through his blouse, comes out the other side, leaves a, a, tr a mark, a lead mark across his T-shirt. That's how close this kid was to killing him. I did not know that. Uh, Art came up there whenever I finally got him up there. He says, I felt, it felt like a bullet went right across me. I said, oh no, it's like that whenever I start shooting. You, know? <laughs> you get your imagination goes to everyone I'm really close. So he, he came in and he actually showed me, and I guess, well, you can't argue with that when you see the lead line across there in a bullet hole. But I got up to Billy as soon as, I, well, when I said I'll be there as soon as I get him off ramp, I kind of figured where the firing was coming from, I came up and I fired. Now I fired a total of five rounds. I fired two and three round burst. I got a submachine pistol on him. That's all I fired. But the firing stopped on me, on Billy's area, and I went to Billy. And when I got to Billy, I tried to find where he was hit. He's got a pack on and I'm trying to find, feeling around, I can't find it and I'm trying to decide that I can't find it. I need to get him back out of cover because I know they got the high ground. Harris said in a statement that he thought I was standing over Billy. I wasn't standing, I was kneeling because I knew that what I was doing was stupid, but it was important to me that Billy know I was there for him. I grabbed Billy and I tried to get him, drag him back and I could not drag him back. So it was pretty much that time Billy started moving his mouth and he was in real distress and I could tell he was dying and I put my hands on his carotid artery and it stopped so I picked up his weapon I looked at his weapon his weapon was on fire but I never realized he ever fired a round out of it at the time I put it on safe and I took it back to my place and I called uh, we'd already had the, the paramedic and all the team coming in to help us and I basically, I did not tell anybody that he had de died because I couldn't say the words. But I was very concerned that the guys who were coming to help us could be shot by that group or by us, or they may shoot me. I said, don't shoot me because I'm going to try and draw their attention when they get close because otherwise they might pass us by. But I had Billy up, I mean, he had Artie up there by us now, and all we did was wait on the other team. 
and after we got together, that's when we made the decision that two guys would go back and get help, and we would stay there. Uh, would not leave Billy. And I, I do recall someone made the, uh, when we did get a hold of other officials, they, why we, we didn't we just leave him and come back and we wouldn't do it. But it was probably the worst night of my life there, too. It was a bad day, but that night, we had night vision until we'd come in the morning before. That night, the cloud cover came in so heavily, you couldn't see with the night vision. It was just terrible. Frank Norris was taking the back. He was covering our rear. Art and I were laid out taking the two fronts. And it, w it went on and on for, <laughs> we were basically just, there was a plane flew over and there were shots fired and we told them they needed to restrict the airspace because they might think it was a law enforcement aircraft and somebody could get shot down for nothing. And we basically just kept giving instructions and then they kept telling us that they were going to send somebody up and it didn't work out. Finally, uh, Dave Hunt, who has my greatest respect, brought a team from uh, Idaho State Police. And they brought us up, I think, I don't know what time they got to us, but when they got up there, I know we got down at 1.15 in the morning. On the way down, they, they brought a body bag, and we were carrying Billy down in the body bag. And the straps, would keep, they kept breaking on the thing, and we dropped Billy, and we had to pick him up. And it was, was it probably the worst part of this whole damn thing for me. And at one point, the leader of the uh, special response team from Idaho State Police said, can we leave him here on the side of the trail and come back? Because it's, you know, I'm responsible for everybody's life here, and I don't want to endanger anybody's life. I said, yeah, we can leave him, but I'm staying with him. He'd been dead since 10.30. I was afraid the varmints would come along and bother him. We went on, and it wasn't 15 minutes. We were at the truck. And then it was, uh, it was probably, we got in the prisoner van. And that's what they bought that was big enough to transport us in. We wouldn't let them shut the door. <laughs> We'd be locked in the thing. And, and we hear all these reports of the people that were gathered up there trying to get us as, you know, they were protesting and all this other stuff. So we got in there and the light was on in the back and one of our guys took the rifle stock and bam, <laughs> busted out the light. And then they took us to the, the protesters and we got through them and we went straight to the emergency room. And then I had to call Billy's wife. I had to call my wife, I had to call Billy's wife. 